Hello and welcome to Camp Xbox. It's time once again for another demo disc video. Here I chronicle every demo disc that came with the official Xbox magazine. Check out the other videos in the series after this one, but today we are discussing demo disc number 11, which came with the October 2002 edition of this magazine. We have some fun stuff to cover, but first I want to thank my YouTube channel members for their support, and all footage was captured off of an original Xbox. But let's go ahead and hop into this one. First, let's get started with the demos, and I know I usually wouldn't start out these videos with the demo section, but I want to inform you that all of the demos are repeats on this disc. As usual with these cases, I don't cover repeats. There are demos here for Crash Bandicoot, Halo, Hunter the Reckoning, Max Payne, Spider-Man, Star Wars Jedi, Starfighter, and Time Splitters 2. And that's a great set of demos, but all of them have been covered previously, so be sure to check out other videos if you want more in-depth coverage of those. I would say that for anyone who just picked up this magazine for the first time, this disc would have excellent demos to play. Unfortunately though, there is no new demo content to cover, but we do at least have new features to cover. The first feature of today's disc is a preview of Lotus Challenge. I had never heard of this game before recording this footage, and it has a fascinating history. Lotus Challenge came out in 2001 for the PS2, but only in Europe. An American Xbox port was announced earlier in 2002 as Lotus Arcade. This was to be published by Virgin, but then it switched to Zycat as the publisher. And a GameCube port was announced, but that would get pushed to 2004 and be published by a completely different team. The Xbox version was due to release in January of 2003, which is why it's popping up here in this demo disc but it wouldn't come out in North America till April 2003. It's a surprisingly intense history for a game like this, but it does look like a great racing game from its gameplay. The cars look realistic with some lovely track designs, and I love to see car soccer show up here, giving off early Rocket League vibes. The Xbox has some great racing games, and this one looks up my alley, so I will definitely check this one out. Next is a preview for the first Splinter Cell, which came out a month after this disc's release. It's a great preview showing what made this game stand out in 2002, the excellent shadows and the range of movements at Sam Fisher's disposal. I'm surprised at how much gunplay is shown in this trailer, but I think that lets the viewers know that you can mix stealth and action to get a full experience. It's a solid showcase.
Next is a preview for the Xbox exclusive Toe Jam and Earl 3 released the same month as this magazine. This game had a tough development, being in the works for the Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast. The developer wanted to release it on the PS2 and GameCube, but Sega pushed it for the Xbox. I think it's a fun little game, and this preview shows that off. It has the same gameplay as the original and shows off the 3D environments. It highlights all the characters and shows off the co-op, which I think is always a plus. It has an excellent funky beat behind it, and it has a style that fits the franchise. I think it's a fun little preview that should entice any fan of the original, but seeing as the sales weren't that great, it might not have appealed to everyone. Where you going, little guy? Jam, you oughta eat a bit more. You looking a bit on the skinny side. I'ma find you some food. Next is an interview with the band No Doubt from Malice, since they did voice work in the game, which features Gwen Stefani as the main character. Malice was another game with development hell issues that we've discussed in this series before. It was supposed to come out only a few months after this disc, but was pushed, then it was cancelled, and revived, and wouldn't make it to the console until June 2004. Which I find funny because the band No Doubt would go on hiatus in 2004 and Gwen Stefani would launch her monumental solo career at the end of 2004. I think that makes this a fun time capsule interview. I love hearing all the band members talk about their gaming experiences. One of them was flexing all of their arcade machines that they owned. You also get to see some behind the scenes footage of the recording. It's nothing insightful, but I think it's fun, especially considering what would happen after this interview. Tom Duscott Mod. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tom Dumont. I'm the gamer. <laughs> uh, Tony's also quite a gamer, actually. I like playing games, too, yeah. Probably um, not as much as you. I think, um, I mean, for me growing up, you know, I first got an Atari 2600 system when I was a kid. I think that's like the classic home video game console. You know, all the, all the great games were on that. I um, can't remember them. Pong. Uh, Pong. Like, uh, what was the game with the tanks? Oh, Combat. Yeah, yeah. Combat, you yeah. know, all that stuff. That came with the system for yeah, free. Yeah, that was the free one. But, I, you know, all the others came out. And then, you know, just went on to, like, when arcades came out and were popular when I was a child. Like, it was, you know, spent a lot of time at the arcade. I think we all did. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, when I grew up, I used to play in television. And there was, you know, there was the people who played Atari 2600, the kind of run-of-the-mill people who just enjoyed those kind of games. And then there was the Intellivision mm -hmm. group of people, intelligent television. You know, it was just a different <laughs> ilk of, of people. And, um, yeah, I would play the Intellivision games, and I enjoyed a lot of that stuff. Um, and then I remember when arcades came around, there was one down the street. 
and my parents would give me maybe a quarter well all the other kids had much more than that you know like a few dollars worth of change but I used to have a quarter so you'd go down there and then you'd have to pick which game you're gonna play and I was terrible back then because I didn't have much practice so you know the quarter would last a minute and then you'd walk home and that would be pretty much the end of the uh, adventure I'm still a kid like these guys um, to the point where I have some video games in my house um, Miss Pac-Man, Kiss Pinball, Asteroids, Galaga and uh, Mario Brothers. The full stand-up one? The full, the full arcade size ones. Tell them about your KISS one. Uh, the KISS one's signed by uh, all four original KISS members. We found out about the game because the Sierra people came to us and they proposed that we put some of our songs in, in this game and then it kind of evolved into like, well maybe you guys can kind of be in the game and do the voice and that seemed kind of exciting. The thing is, is that these days, um, there's so many different kinds of like activities kids can be doing and music seems to be going farther and farther down in people's priorities in their lives. So I think it's a really interesting way to kind of introduce um, new music to people that maybe hearing and discovering bands um, for the first time, you know, maybe a young 12-year-old boy hears No Doubt for the first time. It's pretty exciting for us and for him. Well, we're very excited because three songs from our Rocksteady record are going to be in the Malice game, Platinum Blonde Life, In My Head, and Detective. And those, it's kind of cool for us because those aren't necessarily singles off the record, or they haven't been so far. So it's kind of like people get to um, see a different, maybe a different side of No Doubt, would you yeah. say? I think a lot of times people just hear the songs that are on the radio and they have kind of a preconceived idea of what we are, but if you really get into our albums, it's like there's a lot more than just the singles, and um, I think it's really cool for people to be able to like hear some of those songs in this game, especially if it's the first time they ever are getting into a band or, um, or something like that, they can discover us there. If you study, um, if you look at movies really carefully or video games these days, um, the, mu the soundtrack um, often really like um, helps to underscore like the um, the storyline or the emotional side of what's happening, you know, especially in films. But that's video games have gotten to that point where there's um, the, you know there's a certain uh, excitement that comes from the music, and I think that those three songs are excellent choices to um, you know to reflect that for Mouse. It's another way to collaborate, you know, with a whole other medium. And this whole album was all about collaboration in the first place. Rocksteady was like us working with a lot of different people and um, trying to expand and grow. And like Tom was saying, it's just a whole other creative way to be involved in a whole other art. So it's cool for us. Well, I can tell you that I think both of you are this small. <laughs> like when I look at you, you're this small and so really? is she, yeah. And you both live on my TV. Yeah. And you're both cartoon characters. <laughs> so those are some things you have in, in common. I think Malice and Gwen are both kind of like, kind of badass in, in a way. You know what I mean? There's, a, there's an assertive kind of uh, <laughs> empowered nature to, to what, you know, the way they approach what they're doing. You know, you rocking the stage, Malice rocking the game. Yeah, I kind of see it as like, um, like I was saying about the whole you know, the mu music world being a little bit of a man's world and especially like the rock part of it when you get up on stage and we did that festival the other day and it was like, it felt so good to be me up there in the sense that there was like all these rock bands that played before us and it was very male and then we got up there and people were still kind of going off, like it didn't matter. I think kind of, if I could like compare the two, mm -hmm. she's like in there and she's fighting all these things. and. Not to get too serious about it, but <laughs> you asked if there's any similarities. Does that make sense? You both fight, you both fight evil. And you we both do? fight crime. <laughs> yeah. And you, you both.
Next is another Pyramid of Destruction segment. This entry has the gang going around in Halo 1, doing vehicle death matches, soaring into the air, and getting some fun destruction in. It's non no XM disc without a list of the top 10 plays of the month. This is a good one because it includes many new games. In particular, I like the Dave Nero ones because they are pretty silly. Moving into the extra content section, we have a trailer for Hitman 2 which came out in October. This is an excellent trailer for a great game. It sells the sandbox feeling showing all of the locales you can visit. It shows a bunch of different kills, and it all fits with the opera style music. It's a solid trailer to showcase exactly what the game is all about, and it's fun to watch.
Next is a trailer for Dead to Rights. This game had already come out in August, but the PS2 and GameCube ports weren't out yet. This is purely cinematic, does not show off any gameplay at all. It's a fun trailer because it plays like a movie and showcases your dog that you get in the campaign. It's an entertaining watch, but I would have liked to have seen some gameplay if I had seen this back in the day. The final extra content is for Enclave. This Xbox RPG had already been released in July of 2002. This is a fun RPG with a solid trailer. It sells the RPG feeling with the grand story cutscenes, it also shows off the swordplay combat, and makes it feel like a huge RPG, especially for a console release. I like the bits where it shows the destructible environments. It does an excellent job of selling the game. It is, said it is said that a great wizard created the rift, ripping the earth apart, 
dividing light, light from, from dark. dark, preventing an apocalypse. This earth holds an imaginable power. Our enclave is in turmoil. The rift will keep us safe. And when it closes? We battle for what is right. We have long lost our innocence. Holding the land is holding the magic. The rift is the only thing keeping us apart. They will fight for it. They have already begun. The final section is the video verdict section, which contains condensed versions of the magazine's reviews. There are a ton of old reviews on here, but we do have three new game reviews added to the mix, and I'll go ahead and read through them. Gun Valkyrie got an 8.2 out of 10. Graphics. Incredible, bizarre, otherworldly art design combined with incredible detail and raw Xbox power equals breath taken away. Immersion. Feels just like we imagine rocket boosting around a hostile alien world while hefting heavy artillery wood, but the wildly careening camera and non-intuitive controls occasionally break the spell. Sound. Sparse and thin, though some of the sound effects boast some serious nostalgia appeal. Design. Ambitious gameplay feels unlike anything else. The levels are mercilessly designed and crazy graphical effects are everywhere, but other areas camera, sound, control scheme, and targeting are a bit lacking. Good. Damn, this is pretty. Completely unique gameplay experience. Strangely rewarding toughness for hardcore players. Bad. Damn, this is hard. Control scheme and camera are tough to get used to. No multiplay. Perplexing. Who on earth can see this end? You'll see. Hunter the Reckoning got an 8.9 out of 10. Graphics. Smooth, high resolution textures and all the bells and whistles to show off the hardware's power. Immersion. Frenetic. Fast paced action and ambient soundtrack pull you in and keep you playing. Sound. Moans, groans, and a Silent Hill-esque soundtrack make for a positively wondrous Dolby 5.1 treat. Design. Level layouts, controls, everything is top-notch for a multiplayer action game that's addictive and easy to pick up. Good. Addictive and super action-packed multiplayer action. Highly detailed smooth graphics with near to no slowdown. Variety of weapons and enemies keep up the pace. Bad. Later stages in multiplayer are stupid hard. A user-controlled camera is sorely missed at times. Character animations are a little spotty. Perplexing. 
Why can't the innocent save themselves? The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind got an 8.1 out of 10. Graphics. Beautiful, incredible water effects, character and NPC animations can be choppy. Immersion. Fantastic control scheme and an incredible attention to detail throughout. Sound. Awesome, except for footfall and weapon strike effects. Particularly cool via a surround sound system. Design. Extremely open-ended gameplay and a few game balance caveats. Good. Incredible amount of replay value. Absurd amount of things to do. Bad. Monsters, combat, somewhat repetitive. No construction kit. Perplexing. Is this the right type of RPG for a console? Alright, well that wraps it up for today. This was a much smaller disc than usual in terms of new content. It's sad to get no new demos, but there is a lot of fun stuff here, and plenty of notable additions to this one to make an entertaining package. It would have been a good pickup back in the day if you had never collected the earlier discs. But be sure to comment below with your thoughts and feelings on this demo disc, any memories you have with the games, or any games you're interested in playing now. Leave a like as it really helps out with this video and the channel. Subscribe to keep up with the retro Xbox content, and be sure to hit the bell to stay notified on all of my new videos. And I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube channel members. Thank you so much for your support. And I'll see you here next time at Camp Xbox.